Revelation 13 tells us about a coming totalitarian ruler, the likes of which no human being has ever seen. He's going to make people take a mark. He's going to eliminate cash. And what comes after that is unthinkable. Get ready because a new world order is emerging and the elimination of cash is their primary tool to effect this change. I think people need to understand the natural progression of what we're looking at geopolitically because the, um, the geopolitics in all of this has accelerated things to a rate that are, uh, it's, it's, it's beyond breakneck, okay? So uh, we'll just lay out the scenario really quickly, okay? We go back to the Gorbachev days, and I'm going to be very quick about this. An agreement gets made between Gorbachev and, in essence, the United States of America being at the head of the agreement that basically says, I am going to, in essence, affect the beginning of the breakup of the Soviet Union, right? And in exchange, you are going to give me certain security guarantees. Perhaps the greatest of those guarantees is that NATO will not expand. Specifically, it will not expand into the areas that surround Russian national security interests. Um, uh, this is when we start talking about Ukraine and all of the politics with Georgia, Crimea, all this stuff. Um, uh, even there were concerns with Belarus and many other nations that surrounded uh, Russia specifically because, of course, Russia being the head of the USSR. Now, what happens is there's an agreement that gets made and almost immediately from the point that things start breaking up, almost from the day that the wall comes down in Europe, right? Yeah. There's already talk about the expansion of NATO. The problem with that is it has always been rhetoric. And that rhetoric, by the way, was what started the nuclear arms race after what they called the end of the Cold War. There was a new nuclear arms race that started, and it was because of the rhetoric with respect to NATO. Now, what ends up happening is United States of America, with people like Lady Graham and McCain and lots of these other uh, uh, basic traitors to our nation— they start talking about not only expansion of NATO, but they start talking about the expansion of NATO in order to affect a proxy war with Russia because they're concerned about elements that they see from within Russia that, of course, are exposing the clandestine operators and operations, for that matter, that exist within Ukraine and other areas that surround this area of Russia. By the way, the existence of these clandestine operators uh, United States or American clandestine operators in those regions solely centered around the concern with respect to Russia. And as a result, this is um, what happened. As a matter of fact, we believe that in World War II, um, many of the attacks that Russia endured may have been a direct result of the uh, manipulation that was taking place on the geopolitical front resulting from the actions of certain American clandestine operations at the time known as OSS, you know, after that became the CIA. But here's the thing that we have to talk about. When that starts to happen, American rhetoric begins to grow. And when I say American rhetoric, I'm not talking about the American people. I'm talking about the dirty, nasty politicians that actually want to feed the war machine because the war machine is what paid for their campaigns. The war machine is what gave them their private homes. The war machine gave them their private jets, their security details, whatever. And so these people are now pushing our politicians to continue on with the rhetoric related directly to the expansion of uh, NATO and specifically not just the expansion of NATO, but the expansion of NATO using Ukraine as the forefront of the expansion model, right? Yeah. And so that begins to happen. Russia says, oh, heck no, I'm not having it. Enough's enough. And he goes to NATO about two years ago and he says, NATO, you better off yourself or I'm going to off you. And NATO goes, ha, 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 ha. We're not having any of that. And eventually uh, Putin is forced to do what he did. Now, with that, we know all the details that are tied to that. But the United States of America said, OK. Well, not only did we encourage you, Putin, to go do this, and we kind of tied your hand. We forced your hand to do it. We knew you were going to do it. Now we're going to penalize you for doing it. And the way we're going to penalize you for doing that is by destroying the American economy. Well, how are we going to destroy the American economy? Well, we're going to destroy the American economy because during a moment where inflation is at its highest rate because we're coming off of the uh, CCP virus, right? Yeah. Because of all of that. Now we have a situation where instead of controlling the inflationary mechanisms that tend to uh, propagate um, economic 
uh, de-expansion, right? What they do is they actually add to that by basically saying, we're going to sanction Putin. Now, Putin says, okay, enough is enough. I was given the permission to expand Nord Stream and actually build it out and finish it by the president of the United States. So I have full rights to that pipeline. And so Europe, guess what? You don't get any gas anymore because I'm tired of producing it because I'm running out of production space. So I'm not going to do it, but I still will sell you a lot of it if you need it. But the only way you can buy it is through the ruble. You can no longer buy it through the American dollar, which was the standard because of the lack of massive deltas with the inflections that happen in the uh, value of the dollar. In other words, the fiat currency known as the United States dollar didn't move a lot, right? It didn't go up and down. It was just at a steady rate, right? You would have lots of other currencies move up and down, which is why we have what you would call the petrodollar, right? What right. many refer to as the petrodollar. Right now, that's an ambiguous term because the reality of it is we don't have that standard anymore because of the deltas we're seeing in the movement of all of the money and all of the economics, so what happens is this, Putin says, no problem, pay me with the ruble. Everybody says, nah, we're not doing that, we're not doing it, but quietly they're paying him with the ruble. Then on top of that, you take the JCPOA, which is this nuclear deal that's worth not even the toilet paper that everybody used to wipe their rears this morning. The Biden regime chooses to expand the powers of the JCPOA, and in doing so, they make an agreement within that particular document that says, we will pay any nation that wants to supervise any nuclear expansion that exists within Iran. And so the only nation that's willing to supervise that type of expansion is Russia. So now we're paying Russia, even though we have sanctioned them, we're now paying Russia to supervise Nuclear operations within Iran, which is becoming a direct threat to Israel, which Israel is fully aware of it and they understand it. I guarantee you Bibi understands the full implications of everything that is going on. Yeah. So now the U.S. dollar has become literal poop and organizations like BRICS are taking advantage of the opportunity that it has to destroy the U.S. dollar, fully understanding that the destruction of the U.S. dollar will create a different supply and demand model, which will be based on a bartering type of a mindset, which then brings us into a cashless society, which then takes us to the Revelation 13 world. So, I, I, and by the way, what I just explained to everybody is a very brief summary of what is, okay? There's, I could get a lot more complicated with this. I could get a lot more involved with this, yeah. but that's what is. And then that leaves us to where you pick up the ball, because you're seeing a whole bunch of things that surround this with flights. You're seeing this with money. You've been talking about bricks for a long time. Yeah. Um, and you've come up with some very brilliant assertions regarding what this all means. So, yeah. Monkey, go for it. So, for those that are scratching their head going, what is bricks? Like, uh, just to back up just a little bit, because there are some folks that don't know what bricks actually means, right? It's yep. an acronym, as we always have acronyms for everything. Yeah. But it's Brazil, Russia, India, China. In South Africa, those are the founding members of the economic bloc, so to speak. Um, but uh, you know, you look at those. China is a powerhouse. Brazil for South America is, is is a big one. Russia, massive. India, massive. Right. South Africa, uh, you know, it's a big player, but it's uh, it's it's not on the big stage. But it's uh, if you start pulling in the rest of the African nations, then uh, it all of a sudden gets really interesting. They could pony up just given the fact that uh, we watch all the things that have just happened across the belt of Africa, which is to the south of the north uh, of the uh, the Horn of Africa, right? That's all of those those countries we talked about that are rich in gold and oil and everything else that Russia is getting very cozy with at the moment. And uh, the United States has basically been told to go pack sand. But yeah, there's, there's uh, a lot of that. Uh, and there's a, a total of, I think, 41 countries that are interested 27 that look like they're going to meet the initial criteria yes. but 40 plus nations that are all going to jump onto this bricks that means they're getting off the petrodollar they've already started to trade oil in uh in alternate currencies as you were talking about right um but you also have to back up a little further and and recognize that what has put us in this predicament where we don't have the leverage that we had before isn't necessarily our fight against Russia and all of the sanctions, but it's the shot that was fired 
about two years ago when the Chinese quit shipping stuff to the United States. Yes. Right? That is what started slowing our economy down. That's what started uh, – we started running, having all the shortages and everything else. Um, and so that hasn't changed. And that's what a lot of folks don't realize. The reason you still can get things from China is because there are a handful of boats that come with stuff. It's a slow boat from China. It takes about three weeks to get stuff from from China to the United States. And what is happening is they're having to fly things, right? So you got the Atlas Airs, the Coletas, uh, the Western Globals, all these different companies that are actually going over uh, and picking up uh, stuff like pharmaceuticals and things that are, are mission critical, um, superconductor chips. And they're flying them all over here um, because they have the margin to do so. Uh, but that is why we're still able to get certain things here. Um, but you look at companies like Walmart and Target Boutique and everybody else. You remember fourth quarter of last year, uh, you may remember that they they basically canceled about two or three billion dollars in orders that were still on the books because they couldn't get the inventory to, to uh, justify the spend and it was going to kill them. Um, it's uh, it, it was going to kill them basically with their their shares, right? All their their shareholders and everything else. So um, but that's that's the big piece. You have to remember China already fired the shot that weakened us economically. They were already strategically positioning themselves to do that, right? They've they've the, like I said, the nail has been in the coffin for a while. That weakened our economy. And now what we have is is basically you take it over to the other side into Europe and now you've got all of the NATO countries who uh Europe EU is already in a recession. They're in a heavy recession. And us popping off the, the Nord Stream didn't help that situation. In fact, it probably no. expedited it, right? Accelerated it. But um, so there's that aspect. And um, and then also we're giving Ukraine so much stuff that they, they, they're they losing it. There's no accountability for the money, the billions, the $150 billion so far to date uh, that has just been pumped into the country. And uh, we've... We've basically depleted all of our ability from uh, our, uh, artillery to tanks to everything to go fight a war against two of our biggest enemies, China and Russia, if we had to fight it. it's uh, we, we put ourselves in a very bad situation. But, but the BRICS aspect, uh, you may remember, too, our strategic petroleum reserve is at the lowest it's been since 1982, and it's, that was yes. its inception. Yep, that's right. So if you look at that and figure, oh, we're down to this little small amount, we've got about three weeks worth of oil. If you looked at how much do we consume uh, per day, and I want to say it's like 50, 50 million barrels a day or 52 million barrels a day here in the United States that we consume uh, in driving cars and, and you know everything else gasoline-wise. So if you look at all of that, and you now look at the the oil prices. They're predicting by the end of the year into into early 2024 that the price of oil is going to be around 150 dollars a barrel. Which, if it gets to 150 dollars a barrel, you can oh. it's uh, our game over. energy. We're going to be crippled because yep, car gasoline in your car is going to be you know you're talking probably 15 dollars a gallon. I mean for for the the good stuff. I mean it's going to be pretty bad. Yep. Um, Energy costs around the world are going to go up astronomically. But these people that are in control of it, which would be, you know, you get over to OPEC and you look at Saudi and Russia. Uh, remember, the United States gets or, or got used to, I don't know if we still do, 18% of our of our oil consumption comes from Russia. Yep. And yep. so I know. And, and by the way, that number increases exponentially when we're talking about Europe. If mm -hmm. you just isolated to Europe alone, that number, I think, is reversed it's it's a it's insane yeah. you're probably what what would you say maybe 78 80 percent yeah it's pretty high for sure i don't i don't know it off the top of my head but it's definitely high um but but if you just take that and um and you look at uh the fact that that we are trying now to get our oil from venezuela which you know you go back eight months before uh, flashbang ever went to Venezuela or, or he didn't go, but ever started talking to Venezuela <laughs> um, eight months before he even started talking to Venezuela, who was down there, the Chinese and the Russians, both oh, yeah. of them down in Venezuela uh, making deals. So believe me, um, 
Well, here's what's really stupid is uh, the United States is the number one exporter of oil in the world. And a lot of folks may not realize that. But you think, okay, well, wait a minute. Why don't we just stop exporting a little bit and start refilling our SPR and then maybe maybe take care of the home front a little instead of sending our stuff abroad? Um, well, it's because we can't. If we do, you're going to collapse the the economies around the world because their their oil costs are going to go through the roof. And, oh, by the way, they're going to find an alternate source and they'll go to Russia for it, or they'll go to, to Venezuela, they'll go somewhere else, and we'll lose that business. And that's why we can't afford to stop and and you know or reduce it. So yeah, we're in a pickle here, my friend. A big well, pickle. and there's and there's one variable that I want to throw your way. You mentioned the whole idea with uh, p- uh, other nations wanting to join on to BRICS. Yeah. Well, I want people to keep this in mind, and my suspicion on this was confirmed by an interview that I saw with Mohammed bin Shalomin. Uh, with Brett Baer. One thing that he said, and this was a really important detail because he confirmed a suspicion that I had, but I had no way of confirming it because there's nothing published on this issue, but he did confirm it for me. He was talking about his membership into the G20, okay? And he was talking about how shameful it is that Saudi Arabia in the 70s was in the top five economies in the world and slipped to, I think, number 19 or number 21. Yeah. And he's right. He comes in, MBS comes in. He does a lot of work in helping to develop a dominant um, policy for economics. Yeah. And they have, it has paid off. I think right now they sit at 14. And he was in the G20 uh, meeting. And um, he wanted to come. He wanted to be a part of the G7. Now, obviously, his economy would have to fall within the top seven. But he wanted to apply into the G7. And initially, he ran into this with the G20. Yeah. And what they told him is they said that they would love to admit him as a member of either. But what he had to do was he had to be a part of BRICS. Hmm. And I had had that suspicion. I had had a suspicion that there would be a requirement in order for that to take place. Now, here's the problem with this. And this is the thing that really, really bothers me, right? Because there is a a statement, uh, and I have to go back and find it somewhere, that gets made where all existing members of G20 or the G7 are either a member of BRICS or are applying for BRICS. Yeah. That means something really significant, and it should... uh, maybe cause the production of a few bricks. When you think about this, there is a pun intended there, right? Yeah. But the United States of America is a dominant member of the G7. T- tell me how that works. <sighs> how, how do they end up staying a part of that? So you mean to tell me that this current regime is now either associated with applying to or allowing themselves to be lined up with the values represented by BRICS. Yeah. So does that mean that the United States is helping to destroy its own currency? Sounds like it. That could be the ultimate to usher in this uh, digital currency. Um, I, I, nothing would surprise me more. You know, you know, if they are, they're they're out ahead of it about ten steps, trying to manipulate it, and just like they were with the the whole. Uh, Saudi peace deal thing, right? With um, uh, Israel and Saudi and, and the U.S. was trying to get their hands in there so they could disrupt it. You know, they weren't trying to help it along. And uh, which, by the way, I, I, you know, we're only probably a month or so out from them inking that deal. They said that it's a done deal. It's already. Uh, oh, yeah. Bro. Now it's just a matter of them getting together. Now, th- on that same note, as we talk about all this energy stuff that's going on around the world, keep in mind that when uh, the hook gets put into the mouth of Gog Magog and pulled into Israel, and we do believe that it has to do with energy. And Israel's sitting on the, the largest oil and gas reserves in the world. thousand percent, yep. So, but this is, uh, yeah, I mean, right now we talk uh, U.S. oil prices hit the highest level in 13 months. That was nine, nine hours ago. Um, and, and you can see it is, uh, you know, uh, yesterday in my sit rep, I was talking about the fact that they're predicting Right now, it's going to go to 150, so um, it's just under 100. It's at 90 and some change, I think. Um, so 
natural gas is going up. Uh, some and you said it, by the way, and you said it correctly in your sit rep. And anybody that watched that sit rep will remember him saying this. I know I remember it because it blew my mind thinking about it. I know it was true. He said, if we hit 150, we're done. Oh, remember yeah. you said that? Yeah. And I'm thinking, yeah, I don't think people I, look. Most people don't realize how true of a statement that actually is. Yeah, it's in a, that's a, it's, yeah, it's not going to be, it's not going to be pretty. And I think they know that. I mean, here you've got Janet Yellen already telling people, Hey, get your house in order because, uh, they're saying that, um, uh, that, you know, that countries are starting to get off the dollar yeah, and, uh, absolutely. they can see it, you know, with bricks and everything else. She's like, yeah, the U S dollar the days where we were we were basically calling the shots around the world because of our our money um, are going bye bye. So um, yeah, it's it's interesting, and uh, you know, but then hey, but it's okay, James, because we've got electric cars, so we don't Ugh. really oil doesn't really matter. Uh, or electric car sales in Germany collapsed, like like they they they've lost like eighty five percent of their business uh, this year. That's in Ugh. Germany, right? And so, and now you're talking about somebody that just get, took a direct hit on the Nord Stream, and they they need electric cars because uh, you know they don't have any uh, gas coming through the pipeline there or oil. Um, and but so that's a problem because how did they fuel the electric grid? Exactly. It's the same issue we're dealing with California, bro. We are <laughs> headed towards a major collapse. Yeah, but guess who's cranking out uh, coal like nobody's business? The Chinese. They're pumping <sighs> coal like like it's uh, you know. The new green deal for them, the new black deal, I guess, is what they call it over there. But it's, it's, uh, yeah, they're 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 doubling down on coal, uh, for energy because they they are like, yeah, this other stuff is uh, this is all a bunch of uh, snake oil, man. Um, the other thing too, uh, if you look at uh, look at the U.S., if you look at our grid in the United States, it's not even set up on any stretch of the imagination or level to even handle electric cars. If everybody were to go get an electric car. Right now, good luck. Your grid would just completely because you're drawing down uh, electricity off the power grid to power that thing, and uh, and they're not even set up to do it. Now, let's back up a little bit more. And if you want to know which direction this all of this is going, go look at the board of directors for Lockheed Martin right now. Oh, go see who are on there, and you're going to see that uh, they come out of certain industries. Um, I know nothing about this, bro. You got to talk to me about this. Dude. Yeah, yeah. Like exp expound on this a little you bit. You get guys that you expect, like Air Force general, right? I mean, you 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 know, a retired general coming in uh, on board. You expect that. Um, you get a guy from the Carlisle Group. That's money, right? You got to have that connection. Um, then you get uh, retired. Uh, actually, he's not even retired. He's the president and CEO of the United States Steel Corporation. All right. <sighs> so oh. let that one sink in. But then you start getting guys that were – uh, former CEO of AT and T Communications. Uh, you know, you get a Marine Corps general, but and you get over here to the president and CEO of the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations. Uh, that one uh, ought to make you kind of go, okay, what's going on? Then you get another one. Lady comes in from Sempra Energy, and uh, Sempra Energy, dude, that has BlackRock written all over it. All Holy of these smoke! A lot of BlackRock, right? I mean, that's they 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 BlackRock owns most of our DoD. Uh, contractors and oh, then um you've got another one coming off of petroleum corporation the occidental occidental petroleum Co uh corp it's uh and then one what's the other one? Oh, it's a she's a the retired vp and cfo of of chevron so these are the the people that are now sitting on the board at lockheed and then you got this guy who if you may remember this name jc johnson remember jj oh Jim? yeah he's corrupt oh yeah he? Uh, he's the only guy when I was there that I never, uh, I, I always never gave him the vote, but uh, he's still there. Um, but yeah, this, that's what they're doing. They're stacking the deck and it's all focused mainly on, on the energy side of the house. Although there is one guy that comes from Kimberly Clark, I thought was an interesting dude, but, um, but yeah, they're stacking the deck from a, from an energy perspective. So that tells you the direction that you're going to start to see Lockheed deviate and go. Now, remember too, that uh, Bill Gates just started getting in on the nuclear energy side of the house. He's got his own company and all those other stuff. Largest land landowner in the United States, and uh, and he's in on nuclear energy now. So, 
pay attention to that one because you'll see that stuff start to dovetail in with these military contractors. Uh, you can bet your life on that. Oh my goodness, dude. That is just so crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, uh, I think that what that means is war is imminent. It has to be because you have to feed the war machine in order to be able to produce the necessary result of the catastrophic breakdown of this financial infrastructure that we're talking about. There, there has to be something like that happening. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of that? Well, I mean, remember, war is an economy, right? If you look at the military industrial complex um, and you look at how they've dug themselves out of every other economic woe, um, you can go back to World War One, World War Two. You know, it was all, you know, tied to that that uh, military industrial complex in terms of rebuilding our economies, stimulating it. One of the reasons why right now that our economy is just kind of still just, uh, you know, petering along. It's, uh, you know, you're 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 at altitude. Um, you're on one engine and uh, there's storms ahead. But uh, the reason that it is still just kind of hanging and got one engine is because. They've been manufacturing stuff for Ukraine uh, like nobody's business, right? They're making all kinds of big buys. And it's not just stuff that we send to Ukraine because we're sending them old stuff. But it's the replenishment of the stuff that we've sent to them. And then uh, it's also all of those partner countries in NATO are buying stuff up left, right, and center from the United States. Even Taiwan is, is buying stuff. South Korea, uh, Japan, all of them are just all in getting their house in order in terms of buying large military equipment stuff like missile defense systems. Uh, in fact, we just saw Germany just signed a deal with Israel on missile defense, but the entire world is utilizing the industrial, the military industrial complex to, to try to stave off further collapse of their economies. And that's what we're seeing. And that's why it hasn't completely, you're like, well, why hasn't this Already started. We know Q4, they're saying this is going to get bad. Well, maybe right on the near horizon, we're going to start to see some recession, uh, you know, implications here in the United States. Like I said, Europe's already in it. But but yeah, this whole BRICS thing, U.S. global influence is definitely going to be uh, hit right, right in the old uh, mom and daddy, I'm telling you. And I, I actually believe that we're already in many ways in recession. We are. Uh, we are. They're just uh, manipulating the numbers. I think people yes, feel it. Yes. You know, it's slow. Uh, the thing is, and this is one of the things I learned when I was, when I was working for good old Lockheed Martin. <laughs> and that was everything is how you measure. Okay. If you have a bad metric that's causing everything else to look bad, you take it out. You don't show it. Uh, because it doesn't tell a good story. Listen, I look. I think you're you're right on the money, and yeah. it, this is this is a point that people uh, uh, we really need to ingrain in people. Right, yeah. the government is the United States government has no interest in promoting freedom abroad. What it has an interest in doing is replicating its own purposes and itself yeah. by being able to create a a sort of a, a independent individual economy for the interest of a few very greedy, unpatriotic people. So this is why you have this nonsense of you've got to hire this many uh, blacks, this many Hispanics. This is why you have to have somebody who thinks, you know, they're, uh, you know, XX when they're XY. Uh, I have to get creative how I say that, right? Yep. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy, but that's exactly what's going on. It's a hardened, hardcore manipulation yeah. It's very demonic. It's evil. And it it's part of this beast system that we've been talking about. And this beast system brings in rule through totalitarianism and fear is the mechanism that it drives. And they do it in many different forms. One is the fear of economic failure. Hey, listen, you're not going to uh, thrive as a company if you don't do the things that we're asking you to do. Yeah. So until you become woke, well, then we won't give you this. Well, why do they want these companies to become woke? Because the more woke they become, the more they effectively demonstrate how controlled they actually are. And so this is the thing that I've been saying about the corporate world, including the defense contracting corporate world. I've been saying this from the very beginning. They ought to be careful how woke they choose to go because what they don't realize in doing this, they're, and they're calling it responsible governance within um, within their community, what they don't realize is they're offing themselves. 
Because just like in the study that we did, the Revelation study that we did together, mm -hmm. there's a portion in Revelation where we're able to demonstrate that the Antichrist turns on the whole world and the people that he turns on first, the, the first people that he goes for are the ones that help him get there. Mm -hmm. Th those are the first people that he turns on. And so the corporate world has no clue that that's exactly what's about to happen to them. Yeah. That they're about to get turned on. Why? Because they are being inspired by the same commander in chief, and that's Satan. Mm -hmm. Your assertion there with the manipulation of these corporate entities is critical to being able to understand how BRICS is about to be the most destructive force that we've seen in um, our economy's history. And it's not far off. It can't be uh, just given the world that we're in right now and, and how things are starting to shake loose. It's, um, it, you know, it's it's one of those deals like uh, when you see that ship coming on the horizon and it's uh, it's way off in the distance and you're like, oh, boy, here it comes, man. They're going to attack, you know, um, and then it's just slow. To, it's cruising at about, you know, 14 knots and it just seems like it's taking forever to get here. Um, think of that as a blessing. Uh, oh, and, yes. and I say that because because we have been able to see it coming from so far off, we've had the opportunity to prepare and prepare for our, our you know, spiritually, for our families, uh, you know, when, and, and yes, when I say get our house in order, I'm talking about your prayer, get your, your, your prayer life, get your relationship with God synced up and, uh, and together, but also at the same time, take the time to set yourself some stuff aside so that when it does go south, you're not out there getting in it because it's going to be stupid on the street. And, uh, you know, there are a couple things, James, we've talked about. Uh, I, and, and, and the last time you and I were together, I believe we were talking about the fact that you've got about uh, if you if if the power grid goes down, no, boy, uh, you're going to lose. I think it was uh, 80, 90 percent of the population in like nine months. It's like, just it's a disgustingly real number. It's insane to think, uh, why would people die if you don't have any electricity? Ugh, they don't think through, they don't think it through. That's why. Yeah. But that's something that you have to give some thought to. Right. Um, uh, there's just so many different things. What happens if, listen, if, if something were to go awry, we got, uh, and I was just thinking about this the other night, uh, uh, when I was just going through scenarios in my head, like Donald Trump coming coming on, okay. If he if we get to um, the election and he wins, it's going to be you're going to have an unprecedented amount of a uh, uh, of uprising going on from the far side, right? Because they're going to do everything they can to stoke the fires to to basically make that the worst condition you could ever possibly imagine. And it's not just coming domestically; it's coming abroad too because. You start looking at guys like the WEF, the World Economic Forum. Everybody in the world, when he was president, they hated him being there. He'd show up to the G20, and they'd all just be shunning him um, because he was out. He was an outsider. He wasn't one of them, and they're all a bunch of deep state cronies, right? Yep. So, um, okay, so so let's say he does make it, which I doubt. I And I say that not because we won't vote for him. I think he'll get the votes. I just think they'll they'll just find a way to keep him from getting in. Mm -hmm. um, they could declare war before before say say he wins the election, right? And before he can get to the White House, they go, "Hey, you know what? Uh, we're going to lock things down." They did it in Ukraine just recently with yeah. Zelensky, right? That's they right. knew this guy's going to get ousted. Somebody else is going to come in, and we're not going to have a footing to stand on for to fight this war uh, for our deep state, and so. Uh, they'll lock down. They'll just lock us down. So we'll be in a perpetual martial law, um, you know, no election until the war is done. Um, that's if we get to that point. They, I, I think they'll do things to eliminate, just like we see now, all the indictments, the rest, everything else. They're going to throw the book at him to try and keep him from being able to run. They've even talking about inducing the 14th Amendment, I think it is, or something. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Um, and so... You know, you, you look at the world, you look at the direction it's going, and I do believe that we we are at that point where um, it's going to be it's it's from this point to to November of 2024 is going to be probably the most craziest uh, 
stuff that we we will ever see in our country. Yeah, bro. I listen. I could not wholeheartedly agree with you more. I mean, I I so agree with what you're saying, and the I think the the hard part about this is we're so close to this happening that we, we can't. There's no way to effectively prepare people for it, yeah. right? I mean, it's just it's very difficult. Other than trust the Lord and understand that what the Lord says um, is real and it's true. Um, yeah. But listen, we we're out of time. Any final words, bro, that you want to offer up? No, I just tell people, you know, keep the faith. This is uh, this is this is not our will; it's God's will, and um, and we've been selected for this very day to shine. And um, our work isn't done until uh, until the you know we get snatched up. And so, just um, just stay focused on Him, on the Word, because that's going to get you through all of this.